I'd like to just welcome you all to tonight's ISCAST New Zealand Christians in Science conversation. I hope you've all had a restful and a reflective Easter break. Um, my name's Sarah Wilson and I'm the Program Director for ISCAST. But before I introduce our speaker, let's just open in prayer. Dear God, you hold up our lives in your hands. You have promised to give us a new heart and to put a new spirit in us. Forgive us where we have failed to be good stewards and to be good neighbours. Give us the courage to think beyond our own lives, to live and consume responsibly so that our near and far neighbours can experience a life of dignity and flourish. Help us to restore and admire the beauty of our communities and of this earth. We ask that you be with Richard tonight as he speaks to us and help each one of us to talk openly and boldly about the important issues around creation care and help us always to be mindful of each other and communicate with each other with respect, love and understanding. Amen. Well, I hadn't met our speaker until I began uh, stalking him this year <laughs> about giving, him, um, giving a talk in this series. Uh, over the past few weeks, we've had a few really um, interesting, lengthy discussions, and I've enjoyed listening to Richard and the issues that he has on his heart. Uh, Richard Gisbus is a retired forester, having spent his entire professional life working with nature. Richard obtained his bachelor's degree in forestry from the University of Melbourne in 1977 and has had decades of experience in the Victorian public surface, working as a field forester and also in policy development and planning. Richard has been a visiting research fellow at both the Melbourne University and the Australian National University and has spent several years in community forest development overseas in Nepal, India and Cambodia. Richard also has a very long history as an Iskastian, and I think Chris might mention a little bit more about that uh, later on. Um, but I will um, let him take over now, and he'll be talking on where to with creation care. Thanks, Richard. Thank you, Sarah. I must admit I was reluctant to take this on. I sort of, in some ways, I feel like I'm a lion in a room full of Daniels trying to uh, represent my thinking, which much of it has been in isolation to uh, what a lot of other of you have been thinking. And so therefore I, I wonder how it's going to go down. At the same time, I recognize that we are working in an area of academic and uh, theological safe space. And it's in that spirit that I table my thinking, which tumbles out of my mind like nobody's business. Okay, the creation care agenda has never really caught my imagination and I have struggled to work out why. It is not that I don't like planting trees. I think I have planted a few more than most or that I'm not concerned with nature and our relationship with it. It is something I have dedicated my life and my career to. The following reflect some of my thoughts, some of the thoughts tumbling through my fevered mind on this subject and perhaps we can sort things out together as I think aloud. Quickly first, my name is Richard Gisbus. I studied forestry at Creswick in Victoria, just north of Ballarat. And I have field experience in Telangi, Broadford, Yachtways and East Gippsland, all of that in Victoria, for those of you who are outside of our illustrious state. Um, in 1983, I went with my wife and then three ch children to Nepal and was involved in the reforestation effort there. The picture here is of me as a missionary forester, a Bible in one hand and an ax in the other. I returned in 1986 and spent the next 15 years or so working in forest policy and planning in Melbourne. From the start of my studies in forestry, I struggled with how my faith as a Christian related to my profession. I was heavily influenced at the time by Harry Blamire's book, The Christian Mind, believing then that there are, had to be a Christian perspective on nature and our relationship with it. At that time, there was precious little to go on, 
So to this end, I studied theology by correspondence and then later at the University of Divinity to try and work this out. Throughout, I learned a lot, but was largely unfulfilled in my quest. As one of my lecturers put it, Richard, the questions you are asking are not the ones these people are answering. The following relates to the questions that I'm asking, and I ask that you bear with me as I think aloud in this area. The structure of this session is based around that of Mike Hume's book, Why We Disagree About Climate Change. And it is a book that I strongly recommend that you read and come to terms with. It's been very helpful for me in my thinking. So my, the first point that I want to make in my discussion is that concern for our relationship with nature is a social issue. It is not just a technical one or even ecological or even theological. That, it is, that is, it is not just a matter of planting more trees, developing new technologies or coming up with a new interpretation of Genesis 1. It has become an overarching idea that influences every aspect of our lives. The cars we buy, the things we talk about, how we worship God, how we interpret the Bible, and so on. It is becoming central to our ethics, what we value what we and how we value them. It is part of who we are and how we see ourselves. But as with all relationships, it has many facets each with their own areas of contention. It is not that some people are right and others wrong, we being of pure intent and everyone else, uh, we being of pure intent and everybody else being wrong, um, greedy, uncaring about the planet. Nor is it a series of binary choices, right or wrong, good or bad. It is a complicated melange of options that we have to learn to live with. Hume lists nine of these facets, each with their array of choices, and I'll list them here. First question is, what is our concept of nature? To adapt Hume, nature is an idea with physical as well as cultural aspects. Thus, the young earth creationist will see a nature completely differently to that of an atheist evolutionist. A person from the country sees it differently to someone from the city. Is it benign or is she the ungrateful bitch that Al Gore famously described it? Thus, almost before we start, we have grounds for disagreement about our relationship with nature. The second issue that Hume highlights is what do we want from nature? Nature provides us with everything that we need, energy, shelter, food, Wi-Fi, it also provides wonderful aesthetic experiences and spiritual inspiration. We cannot live without its bountiful provision. But then there are those who are bemused by this anthropocentric thinking. Surely nature has an existence on its own, separate from human utility. Isn't that what the problem is? That we only stand nature, understand nature in human terms? The third point that Hume raises is the performance and role of science. We are told that science is a single body of objective knowledge, tested and proven, and the only sure foundation for confident and right action. And yet, in my forest planning, I had to deal with more than 12 different sciences, each competing for attention, influence and funding. It was a messy process and not a pretty sight, especially when recommendations to protect different values cancelled out other people's recommendations. Uh, was it they say you should never see sausages and regulations being, being made. Um, you shouldn't see forest policy working with these sciences. It's not, it's not a spectator sport. The next point that Hume raises is the endowment of value and the allocation of rights. Value and rights are subjective concepts. And thus, we see that koalas have more value and therefore more right to live than, say, the smallpox virus. Economics and the pricing of goods are useful to represent value, but this is clumsy 
especially for intangible values like scenery and spiritual experience. And then trading these off with things that you can price and the fight then starts to become messy again. Then there are the things that we believe. The language of theology, of morality, and of our aspiration for and accountability to someone outside of ourselves pervades our conversations about nature. That otherwise non-religious people resort to such language highlights the inadequacy of economics and science on their own. For Christians, this includes the idea of judgment but also of forgiveness, reconciliation, reconstitution, and providence. However, even within Christianity, there are conflicts, and the drive to get everyone to see things the way that we do is strong. I'm reminded of John Lennon's song, Imagine. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try, and if only we can get everybody else to think that way, then the world will live as one. I've always thought that song to be naive. Next, there are the things we fear. We fear different things, and there are those in society who play on those fears, and there are others who would disparage them. For some, nature is fragile, and we fear damaging or destroying it. Others consider it to be robust, capable of absorbing the impacts of our activities and adapting. Many of us are more afraid of changing our behaviour than of what might be happening to nature. And so we are afraid of different things. Seventh, there is the communication of risk. I remember Marshall McLuhan's dictum that the medium is the message. And this was before the days of social media. The messages come to us from all sides with different urgencies and calls for us to go in all sorts of directions. This leaves us confused. There is a sense that we must act, but how? What if we're wrong or if we do, if what we do is ineffective? Perhaps we are busy. Perhaps if we are busy, no one can accuse us of not taking things seriously. So look busy. Eighth, there is the challenges of development. The changes in nature highlight areas of inequity, including wealth, gender, sexual orientation and race. Pope Francis's Laudato Si focuses very strongly on this relationship with regard to poverty. Ecofeminism does the same thing with regard to equality. And we're struggling the same thing with regard to the Aboriginal welfare and um, their relationship with nature. The extent to which these contribute to our ecological concerns, or alternatively, the way in which we try to piggy them onto our concerns for nature, adds to the complexity of what we're dealing with. Lastly, in Hume's list, there is how we govern. Government is all about society making decisions. It is, not, it is about setting priorities and trade-offs regarding the decisions we make. Then there is how we respond if the government does not act as we think it should particularly when it appears to abdicate its responsibilities, as many feel that the Australian government has been doing. Here also, I'm staggered at the influence of the market through all of this. It's been interesting the way the market has got itself involved, in, particularly with climate change, and how that has influenced people's investment and attitudes with regard to climate change. So with all this complexity, how do we work out what to do? Hume himself wonders out aloud whether we have created, in, with, whether with all our well-meaning attempts to stem the problems that we, and from all sorts of proper motive, motives, whether we aren't creating a logjam of gigantic proportions, one that is not only insoluble, but is beyond our comprehension. Indeed, there is the uncertainty whether we are not making things worse. Hume suggests that we have locked ourselves into a problem solution mindset that boxes us into a corner. He argues that we need to accept the complexity for what it is and to learn to live with and work within it rather than to strive to conquer it. 
we need to reject the idea that nature and our relationship with it is a problem to be, to be solved. We are dealing with forces we cannot comprehend and are trying to orchestrate outcomes that cannot be dictated. Two and a half degrees um, global warming. Lovely, it's a nice sounding target, but are we really capable of orchestrating it? To help us try to imagine or picture the situation, Hume identifies four biblical myths to which I've added a fifth. The first one he calls Lamenting Eden. He, in this we recall a time when we related to nature in a simpler, less ambiguous way. But somehow we, can, we find that we cannot go back there. The second is presaging the apocalypse. This reflects the fear that we are tumbling towards a catastrophe brought on by our own voracious and uncontrollable appetites. Third, there is constructing Babel. Driven by our desire for mastery to control, or in this case, maybe to repair nature, we are striving for given outcomes, but finding that our construction is brittle. This is, not a, this is not helped by the fact that no one seems to be talking the same language, even if we are using the same words. Fourth is celebrating Jubilee, which we are confronted with the injustices and disparities of power that our struggles with nature are amplifying. How do we call time out to do some resetting? And fifth, there is the suffering servant. Drawn from Isaiah 40, 50 to 40 to 55, we are languishing in travail because of what we have done. It is our fault. But God intervenes after a time, assuring us that we have suffered enough and offers to lead us with gentleness to a new beginning, a new creation. So in short then, I would agree with Hume that there is no in inverted commas, solution to the problems that we have with nature. We are going to have to learn to live with whatever happens. He argues, and I agree, that we should strive to make things better, but no one can say what the outcome will be or what will be the full consequences of our interventions. Does this mean that we shouldn't be doing anything? As Paul says in a similar con in relation to a similar question, no way known. In living with nature, even doing nothing is a decision that will have its consequences. We are dealing with an ongoing relationship with nature in which there will always be twists and turns and, with, and shortages and abundances, pain and celebration. And it's been always thus. And I suspect it's going to continue so, even though we are dealing with what appears to be even more and bigger problems than we've ever done. So this, I, I would say this is not the time for dogmatic solutions or idealized and prescriptive dreams or theologies. Now is the time for a humble, let's try this and see what happens. This is what we did in Nepal. Uh, this is what I suspect Tony Renato was doing over in Africa. And what emerged was marvelous to behold. So what are the things I'm nailing on my Wittenberg door? You'll be grateful I'm not putting 95 theses up. I'm just going quickly through 10 of these that I have. I would argue we are dealing with relationships and not problems. Nature is not a suite of problems to be solved. We are talking about something that we have to live with, to relate to. Second, we have a long, long way to go in this relationship with many twists and turns and surprises along the way. And who knows, God will one day intervene and say, come walk with me like a sheep, shepherd with his sheep. We need to build alliances and share insights. It's what I call the Franciscan approach, and I'll talk about this more uh, later in my talk. We shouldn't waste time painting ourselves into ideological corners. We need to talk and listen to everyone, particularly those with different insights. And for those of us who are Christians, 
the non-Christian people who also have insights. I have much wisdom to share. Fourth, I strongly advocate that we should cultivate good habits and strive for small wins. Enjoying these things as a means of celebration as unto God, because they are good and fun things to do. Planting trees, I used to love doing that, got crook health-wise, and I'm not doing it so much, but it used to be every winter go out and plant as many trees as I could. Take walks, collect litter, get to know the habitats and species in your area. Bore your kids to tears by telling them all about the ecological niches they're working through. Enjoy the life you are given and the relationship with nature that is open to you. Even in the city, there are wonderful areas for you to stroll through, to explore and to enjoy. Talk to your children. When you sit down, when you walk with them, when you drive them in your car, tell them the stories of Jesus. These are the stories that will support them in the unique situations they will face when they grow up. Always be ready to explain to them the hope that we have. And don't leave them with a vacuum to be filled with junk. Pray for those at the front line. Particularly with COVID, we, we were introduced to a whole new raft of frontline workers that we had previously taken for granted. Pray for those at the front line here, the foresters, the rangers, the researchers, the policy makers, the harvesters, the miners, the firefighters, the decision makers and the doers. They are each making their contribution to the best of their ability and recognising what they are offering and recognising what they are doing is something that is worth us taking time in. Seven, thank God for the prophets, those who make, deci those who make decision makers uncomfortable. After all, easy decisions lead to bad outcomes. That said, don't take their passion as a sign that they have everything sorted out and that they have all the answers. Learn to live with the diversity of opinions. There will always be disagreement about what should be done and we should make this a creative and learning opportunity to be welcome. Watch our theology, those expressions of how our faith interprets the challenges we are facing. Keep them open to new ideas and inputs and make them inclusive, creative and inspiring, expressing thoughtful wisdom and a true, if only partial understanding of our relationship with God, nature and the rest of humanity. Tenth, remember all times God is in charge. This is God's creation. God made it and God loves it. We are God's creation too, as well as God's servants and caretakers. So where do I think we go with creation care? I've tried to present something in my notes, uh, and what I've got here, of the complex landscape that we are dealing with. A vista that is frightening and frustrating, in that, is beyond, in that it is beyond our control, and heading off to God knows where. But it is also a fascinating and exhilarating space to be working in for all that. I see it as a rich and multicolored tapestry with all sorts of threads and patterns woven through it, but one in which the full design of our place in it is beyond our comprehension. Creation care thinking might represent one of those threads, Ian Horlacy's Responsible Dominion and Robert White's Creation in Crisis are alternative threads that come to mind. And no single one of these can encompass the entirety of Christian life, experience and thinking on the topic. So where can we go with this? Well, the first thing I think that in creation care, we can concentrate on making the thread greener. Now, Let's just focus on the, the ecological side dimension of it and go and see what we can do to help here. My comment here is it's going to be a wild ride because there have been many twists and turns in the last 30 years of my um, conscious involvement in this area. 
but this prophetic role is important. It is a role to play. But remember that the prophetic role is not the whole story. Second thing we can start to do is the Franciscan dialogue. Pope Francis's Laudato Si urges everybody concerned with it to get talking with others, people with expertise and interests in this area. Andrew Wilson, a friend of ISCAST, initiated a series of conversations for, with the state government relating to living with bushfires. And we could still, we could well consider building on his thinking with regard to that. I've picked in here three of the reports that he has produced available on the internet. Another line of thinking that we could pursue is what I call theoecology. Based on Jewish ecologist Daniel Hillel's book, The Natural History of the Bible, here he relates much of the scriptures to the ecological niches the Israelites occupied at the time. I can easily see a multidisciplinary team of workers, uh, funded by Templeton maybe, reviewing Hillel's work from a Christian context and extending that to the New Testament and the ecological niches there. Being a Jewish scholar, Hillel's work is based in almost entirely on the Old Testament. And I don't think he's a, um, he's certainly not a Christian. And um, the, uh, the spiritual side of things, I think he tends to underdo somewhat. So operating from a Christian perspective would be a marvelous thing to explore. And fourth, the idea of men and women in their daily work. A few years ago, my brother Alan proposed that ISCAS pursue a kingdom project in which scientists document their careers as Christians working in their field. At the very least, such documentation should help demythologize our professions and better inform the community of their work, as well as help us work out the role of our, that, that our faith can play in these areas. As people do this honestly um, and present this from their perspective, we can hopefully start to put these perspectives together and get a bigger and better understanding of the tapestry that we're working in. So that's my thinking, uh, some thinking, but I hope it's triggered things off. I'll leave it over to you and to uh, uh, Chris to lead the discussion and, and questions if you have any. Thank you, Richard. And uh, before we do go to questions, I, I hope you're thinking about questions or comments. Um, before we do uh, go to that, I'll... Um, give you the second part of the introduction to Richard that um, Sarah alluded to before. Uh, those of you who've been around his cast for a while know that uh, Richard is really my predecessor in a sense. Uh, Richard and his wife, Glenis, um, well, I was going to say single-handedly, but I've just mentioned two people, so it isn't quite like that. But Richard and his wife, Glenis, uh, effectively ran his cast for how many years, Richard? I mean, over a decade. About 15 years, I think. Yeah, like that. yeah. So um, a lot of a lot of what is cast today is today is uh, thanks to Richard and Glennis and their and their team. Anyway, that's a bit more a bit more introduction and a, and a public vote of thanks too. Um, oh, thank now, you, that, now that they've retired, they're down on the island, and um, his cast has um, gone to Forest Hill. But uh, we recognise that death. Um, okay, where are we up to? Barbara Speed. Thank you so much. Will a transcript be available? Um, well, we, his cast won't be providing a transcript unless Richard has a transcript that he'd like to let us have, and then we could put it up somewhere and put the link to it um, or the slides, whatever. Uh, so uh, we, we could arrange that. Certainly the video will be up on our YouTube site and the link to that will also be on, uh, on the conversations page excuse me, on, uh, on our website. I, I have everything written down and I'm happy to send the file to anybody if they send me an email, there's my email address and I can send oh, it great. to them. Great, so we have time for conversation. Charles, go ahead. Uh, yes, um, thank you very much, Richard. I particularly like your uh, statement about too many people paint themselves into a corner. I'm uh, particularly thinking of the those who have all these alarmist type theories of climate change. 
uh, where somebody said for the past 30 years, they're saying that the world will kill itself within 10 years and appear to be still saying that. Um, yes, uh, would you say that that was one example of this painting yourself into a corner? It, it wasn't, I wasn't thinking about that so much, although I must confess that um, given that through my profession, I have been chasing um, ecological predictions and I've been trying to deal with them. I have to try and introduce procedures to protect the um, uh, pygmy possum, for example, uh, the mountain pygmy possum here in Victoria. Uh, we tried to protect the uh, slopes in the Himalaya in Nepal. Um, and we did find that in many cases, the, um, the concerns were exaggerated. Having said that, it's too early in the game for climate change. I am, I must confess, I am nervous about where that is taking us. But uh, Mike Hume in another place, he has a, a, um, a few sessions on uh, YouTube you, worth looking at. He argues that the settings for climate change are already in place and there's probably nothing much that we can do about what's going to happen. So I think in many respects, while we need to behave responsibly and do what we can, I think we also need to accept that we are gonna to have to go on this ride and go where it takes us because there's nothing much we can do about it. I should well, point that, out- That's a provocative view, isn't it? Coming, coming from um, a climate scientist, isn't it, Richard? It's um, uh, a provocative view in terms of uh, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, is is saying fairly loudly not only that global warming is, is happening but that what human beings do in the next in the next uh 50 50 and 100 years uh can make a fairly significant difference yeah um i used to say that there was lies damn lies and ecological predictions when i was in nepal we were doing the reforestation because of fears of flooding in bangladesh and um, people had been working in there for decades before I arrived. And I was right in the middle of the, um, there was a big paradigm shift in the thinking about the effect of forestry on uh, the slopes of, of the Himal with regard to Bangladesh. Now, the interesting thing about it is that we discovered basically that it was a, a natural thing that was happening. What was unnatural was setting a, a boundary around something like 40, 50 million people and expecting them to live on the delta of this enormous river system that was flowing out of the, um, the Himal. And, um, and people were blaming the, the uh, lack of trees in the, in the, on the hillsides. It's now everybody's blaming the uh, climate change on that same phenomenon. So I, I honestly don't know what the answer is. Having said that, I think there is grounds for concern. I don't want to sweep that under the carpet. I'm not qualified to say there is no grounds for concern. And there are some very smart and intelligent people whose scholarship I admire and respect who are concerned, and that is enough to scare me. And I think that we do need to live responsibly, and I think we do need to change our behaviour. But I don't know that I can predict what that outcome of that behaviour will be. Now, I'm a little bit concerned. I I, I struggle with the, where the ecotheology thinking is taking us, where it's going. And I kind of thought that some of the people might have wanted to jump up and, and tackle me on that. Has anybody sort of got thoughts or reactions to that? Charles has got another question or another comment. Go ahead, Charles. Yeah, I'd like to commend you on uh, such humility uh, because most people in the climate change debate are so dogmatic, so convinced they're right. Uh, my hope, uh, when I look at the figures and you see how much uh, human generated carbon dioxide there is, and uh, looking at the numbers, that's infinitesimal compared to the rest of climate warming. Uh, I think that the global warm up another couple of degrees, even if human beings stop producing carbon dioxide completely, um, this is a much bigger world system that we're living in. Um, that's half of my 
hope. The other half is God's promise to Noah that, yeah, he is in control. And I, in one way of being in control, I think he's built enough safeguards into nature that it'll handle an awful lot of things that humans throw at it, good and bad. Um, that's one of my... Sorry, who's... Sorry, I've, I've just responded to that, and that is going to the very point that different people fear different things. Mm. And again, this is a, an area of, of the complexity of the debate, that um, there are some people who have looked more closely at it and have come to one conclusion. There are other people who have looked at it at another direction and have come to a different conclusion. Um, I'm not qualified in any way to be able to say what is um, right and what is wrong in this. And as I say, people that I respect greatly have um, are very concerned and who am I to say that they're wrong? Um, having said that, I think there is a lot in the suffering servant image that yes, it was the Jews fault that they were carted off to Babylon. Yes, it was their fault and their behavior that led to that outcome. But God was in charge and he brought about a completely um, different situation where he was able to lead them out. And it was not a matter of uh, ignoring the punishment or the consequences of what they did, but it was that God was still in charge. Yeah, he certainly is. I'll give you my amen. Yeah, can I just make a comment there? I must say I find this a council of despair and the idea that God's in charge and we should abdicate responsibility to me is an anathema. I think we should grow up a bit and think about whether or not uh, what responsible actions we can take and do it with some faith going forward, not just say, oh dear, God's in charge. Let's just wait, you know, see what's going to happen. That's not right. And I, I think it's I'm sorry. Morally inc incomprehensible to say something like that, or to imply something that like that, or take uh, uh, being a, not taking a moral position is a very amoral thing to do. Don't lie down and say, "Oh, gee, no, we're not supposed to oppose evil." That's what we are supposed to be doing. I did I'm, not say that, and I did not imply that. That's well, always I'm, the half of yeah, what God has said. Now, yeah, humans should step in and start looking and uh, then start acting. Uh, my original comment was, I don't think we've looked enough. We've just listened to alarmists. I don't think that's true at all. And I think that you, if you should enable people who've done a lot of hard looking, includes the IPCC, and we should take our lead from them. Uh, and the idea that you think, oh, gee, no, maybe that's not right, when you don't really know, and you should have a little bit more humility in front of the scholarship that's already gone on. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Stephen, if that's what you thought that I was saying, um, that is the opposite of what I was, I was saying. But I think that somewhere in terms of our relationship with God, we have both responsibility, but we acknowledge that the power and the wisdom resides with God. Um, and yes, we are responsible. And you know, the punishment that the Jews had when they were sent off to Babylon was a natural, logical outcome of what they were doing. And there was the need to repent and there was the need for them to um, pull their socks up and acknowledge that they had done wrong. But through all of this, I mean, my feeling is that we've probably got ourselves into a mess that's bigger and that we can cope with and that we can handle. That sounds like the Council of Despair again to me. It may be right, but that doesn't mean to say we shouldn't be working at it pretty thoroughly. And I, that's, I think that's the point. one of the points that I was trying to strongly make through my presentation, Steve. Hi, um, I have a comment. I don't. I missed it, some of this because I was putting my kids to bed. But um, I had a discussion with my youngest son. Um, he is in grade four, and um, the concern and the worry that we've put on our kids about all this is pretty rough. He, some of the ways that he puts his concern about this sort of stuff, um, you know, he'll have nightmares about what's going to happen to the world and all that sort of stuff. I don't think that what anyone is saying is that we should do nothing, but what are we what are we giving to our children if um, you know if we're not giving them the 
the hope and the the um the ability to lay some of that burden onto god um we do what we can but my son's in grade four and he's feeling this and uh you know we're trying to do our bit um but yeah i don't know it's unformed it was this sort of thing that i had in mind when i in my uh trial get the in my uh, Wittenberg door statement about talk to our kids, I really think that we need to bring our kids along with us. They are being influenced in all sorts of different ways from all sorts of different directions to think things and they will receive their own impressions. And I think that we need to be prepared at least for, for while they are children to be in a position to walk along with them in their journeys that they go along and assure them that we're holding their hand just as we are holding God's hand as we're doing this. Well, in the absence of other comments, let me affirm um, what I think is a, a, a real challenge for, for parents, for Christian parents, for parents uh, who, who accept the science, accept the IPCC consensus, however you want to put it, um, but who don't want to bring up their kids under under this threat of catastrophe all the time? How do you bring up your children uh, quietly, confident about the future, but at the same time acting uh, in a way that will do the best we can for uh, the direction we're heading? Selwyn, do you have a comment on that one, or are you? Uh... No, I I do have a comment. I think that the whole. Um, the whole scriptural tradition shows us that <clears throat> depending on the circumstances in which people are, they will talk about God and the gospel in slightly different ways, maybe in significantly different ways. Um, so the circumstances in which we are currently living are ones where there is a lot of uh, discussion, debate, anxiety about the state of the earth. But I, I think the real danger is when we get into the business of simply reacting to all of that, rather than living out of the, um, the vision of a Christian life. Jesus comes proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom in the book of Acts. It's quite clear that this was still something that um, early Christians tried to live by and take seriously. And I think if, if we live our lives and live our, um, our life together, our lives together and our family lives informed by this vision rather than informed by anxieties, we'll be able to give our kids um, some really good experiences and some good wisdom, um, but it's not going to be overwhelmed by fear, and I'm thinking, um, I'm thinking about, well, I'm thinking about two things really. I'm thinking about the local Arosha group here in Dunedin, where I live, and how getting involved in doing stuff just in the ways that people can um, gives them a sense of joy, gives them a sense of gratitude, uh, gives them engagement with with God's world. Uh, I think about one of um, my children's families where they have a huge, um, huge exposure to some interesting conservation issues. And um, these kids' lives are just full of joy and gratitude, and they're deeply involved in, um, in conservation things but it's not driven by anxiety. It's driven by um, a vision of wholeness and joy. And, and I think it's very important for us to be exploring, and you did mention this, Richard, exploring issues of, of what our dominion means. So that's a rather long answer, but um, yeah, Christian discipleship, I think, that's uh, as a pastor, that's where I would um, be wanting to put my energy. Thank you, Selwyn. Um, Chris, I was just uh, thinking uh, just this last couple of responses. Um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm in my 70th year now, which meant that I was growing up in the 50s and 60s, reading Reader's wow. Digests, which were full of stories about the astonishingly uh, overwhelming nuclear arsenals mm. of the USSR in the United States. And that was a constant theme. I remember from probably that I first became aware of it, probably when I was about 10. People are talking about it. It's not that I had television. I was greatly blessed by not having television at home um, growing up. So Granny's was pretty good, but <laughs> um, and the next one neighbours. But um, and I'm quite aware that I was probably protective from a lot of stuff too. But even then, being very aware of that enormous, overwhelming theme. And of course, we now know that the closest we came to nuclear war was in the mid 80s when the Russians uh, misunderstood some things going on with NATO that they thought might have been an attack and was only, so we're only safe from it because the, the person who had, had the responsibility to respond decided that, it, that, that, that he, would, he, would, he would actually act as though it wasn't happening and he, and he was right. Um, uh, but of course, that's the nuclear presence. Of course, um, we knew about tests going off all the time, uh, Mururo, Atoll, all the rest of it. Um, and the different stages going through the, the, the ordinary fission bombs to fusion bombs and so on. Um, but it was a major, th I just remember it was such a dominating theme in our growing up. At the same time, we've got the Vietnam War going on and we've got the sexual revolution going on. Uh, an enormously topsy turvy world looking back on it. Um, I'm not sure for kids it's any different in any generation. There are, there are, there are boogie men and nasties going on in history. Like right now, we've got the Ukrainian war going on. Um, so I, I think the challenge about how we bring up kids Christianly probably is, is no different from age to age. Mm. So I think the last response is really helpful for that. And so living in Christian hope is, is we have to find the way to do that in every generation under every cloud that we find ourselves living under. There might be others who've got other things. I'm just, just only reflecting fairly freshly on this, just listening to a few of the responses. Mm. When I was preparing for the talk, one of the things that I listed and ended up not including was that it seemed to me that each decade was typified by something that we were scared of. The 50s was of nuclear annihilation. Um, I'm trying to remember what it is off the top of my head. The 60s was you know, somewhere in there, population explosion came in. Then there was something else and something else. It just kept on going. And in many cases, these things weren't didn't seem to be solved it's just that we moved on to something else to be scared about and i wonder whether selwyn's um advice is something that we need to consciously take on board and say right what is the christian attitude to these fears that we have it's not that we the the fear of nuclear an annihilation was an an un unreasonable thing and it's not that concern for overpopulation was unreasonable. It's not concern that the hole in the ozone layer, I'm trying to remember what they, these things were. But somehow these things just moved and we moved on to something else. And sometimes I wonder whether we are looking for things to be worried about. We start, we, we've actually made a difference to the hole in the ozone layer by changing our, our use of gases. I mean, there are things we can do about specific problems. And I think that's... And that, that must give heart to people who are trying to do something that's effective, you know, and I'm, I'm quite happy to make changes to the form of uh, locomotion of my vehicle, if that helps in some small way to uh, the problem we see off the east coast of Australia, where the kelp is disappearing under the ravages of the sea urchin, and that is a direct result of temperature change in the East Australian current. And we can be very aware of very specific problems in our environment. And, and, and the big issues now about what's, what's going to happen to the, uh, uh, in the Antarctic um, uh, Southern Ocean area in changes to fundamental balances of forms of life and what, people, what, what animals feed off. So, I mean, I, I think being aware of those things, and I love, I love uh, gardening. I'm, I'm growing 50 my pines at the moment from seed and having great fun doing it. Um, uh, but the reality is that, you know, I'm aware around me, I'm in the Blue Mountains, I see you know, middle of a World Heritage area, and I'm aware of changes I've seen in my lifetime, which can only have to do with global warming, um, uh, after, after looking at them very closely. Um, so I'm trying to do things, say, at least I'm a player, and I'm still walking around in a damaged Eden. We, we have to learn a new set of ways of living. 
um, I think seeking to reduce our impact, reduce our footprint is a worthy thing to strive for. And I think we should do it as a means of celebrating our love for God and of our knowledge of God as the creator of this planet. I, I think that we, and as we find that there's something that we have been doing that we, or that needs to be changed, well, then I think we should change it. I think sweeping those sort of things under the carpet is reprehensible. Okay, Richard, what about Jenny's comment? Jenny, why don't you speak up? Um, I was just um, saying I was wondering if there was an issue of wealth in this and um, some of the healthy or the environmentally responsible choices are actually cost prohibitive and is there an issue of imposing guilt on those who really don't have the wealth um, to do this and are making decisions, um, fundamental decisions about how they survive? Um, yeah. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, <laughs> I agree with you. <laughs> Um, I think we have to learn to stop feeling guilty about things that uh, that we can't possibly do. I wonder whether there's um, a lot of people making us feel guilty for things that, um, you know, the, the comment I made in my presentation about um, just look busy so that people will, will sort of see, hey, look, this person's taking it seriously. And sometimes I wonder whether that's what we're doing, just looking busy. And being, if we can afford these sorts of things, then well, that just adds a little bit more to the kudos that we claim. Let's give Brian a go. Brian's been waiting, I think. Um, and then we'll probably wind up with a prayer from Nicola. Brian, go ahead. Good, thanks. I, I'm sorry, Richard, I missed your presentation. I, I'm in Western Australia with my uh, family and the timing was a bit... <laughs> a bit different so I missed most of it but uh, I wanted to come in on Jenny's point in particular our children grow up, grew up under the uh, the nuclear cloud and one of our children decided not to have any children because it was too dangerous to bring them up in that environment and then strangely and wonderfully uh, against what we expected God brought along a man called Gorbachev and I see Gorbachev as the modern day King Darius <laughs> who let the people go home. Now, likewise, you can say, well, God will bring someone else along in this era to solve the problem of climate change. But the, the issue, it seems to me, is that Gorbachev came along with a one issue uh, address. He was addressing just the one issue. Whereas now we have uh, the climate change, which has so many contributing factors in that. And one of them, of course, is the wealth that Jenny re referred to. Wealth is not bad, but it's what we do with it. And if we could think of old Cadbury and the old Quakers who used their wealth uh, to advance social welfare of their employees, etc., then you get to a very different situation. But my point is that I will not say that God will solve the problem. I will not say that I will solve the problem, but I'm saying it was irresponsible of me not to do everything I possibly can by changing my lifestyle, by reducing my carbon footprint and put it all on God's hands. I must do what I can and also trust that you and others of Christians and, and others who are concerned if we do what we can and listen to the leadership, like Gorbachev came along with a, a new message, then I think that God works through the good intentions and the responsibilities that we have uh, to address the issues and hopefully uh, save us from a sixth extinction. Thank you, Brian. On that note, which uh, I personally think is theologically pretty sound, uh, why don't we finish? <laughs> um, let me hand over to Nicola, who I think is going to uh, say a prayer. Before I do that, let me let me say uh, again, thank you so much to Richard for stimulating us to think about uh, what is what is an issue that will dominate the decades to come, obviously, and uh, dominate the lives of our children and grandchildren. Uh, thank you, Richard. Nicola, over to you. 
Yes, just let me add also a thanks, Richard, for, for raising all these questions. Um, there were so many of them, it was hard to respond in a way. Um, <clears throat> Creator God, um, we thank you for this time tonight and we thank you for all the issues and thoughts that Richard has given us. We celebrate a new unfolding of the universe this day in us and in everything around us. We listen to the silence and we hear the rustling of our breath, the hum of the engines, the cries of birds, the rustling of the leaves in the forest. We question and we adore, we wonder, we trust in your unfolding love. Amen.